Welcome to a new episode of RBFA Talks. This time we talk to our Youth Council. Today, Lamine and our National Manager, Roberto Martinez, are behind the microphone. Together, they address some tricky issues such as racism, discrimination and gender equality. How are you today, Roberto? I'm very well, and thank you for inviting me into your podcast. It's a pleasure. And before we start, I have uh, the serious question about uh, discrimination, racism, and uh, gender equality. Can you tell me what is your greatest memory in football? Wow, that's... Uh, yes, the, I don't think uh, I have one greatest uh, memory. I think probably as a young boy, you are chasing the dream of being able to to be involved in football professionally. So probably the biggest feeling that I had is when I was um, 16 and I signed my first professional contract. So I think within football, it's been, I've been very fortunate. I had many, many um, really strong memories. But if you ask me as an individual, I think the moment that I signed my first professional contract in football will be the best memory because it's something that you, you work so hard And sometimes it doesn't really, um, it, it doesn't really come to you in a clear way. But when you sign the contract, it's almost you put in pen and paper, and you feel okay. Now I think I can show what I can do in football. And I think at different ages, you still have more dreams you want to achieve. To when you are when you were young, you want to sign your first contract professionally in football. When you are coach, also you want to I don't know winning the World Cup. With the with Belgian national team or uh, winning the Premier League title, so I think at different ages you still have dreams and that uh, push you to uh, keep more and more and uh, wake up in the morning and go. Yes, forward. I no think reason. that's very, very, very important. When you are in life, you need to have not just one, but you need to have dreams. Otherwise, it's pointless to get up in the morning and fight for something. Um, You shouldn't be afraid of of wanting to reach the stars. Uh, whatever you do, whatever is your passion, you should have a dream. That gives you always that that uh, reason to face adversity because there is never anything that is simple. You're gonna fail and you're gonna fall and you need to get up and you need to have that dream in order to to know why you're doing it, and then reset those little dreams within the big dream. Uh, there are many little steps that you need to take. And if you can do that, if you are in studies, if you want to do a degree, if you want to just find a job, if whatever your passion is, you need to have a dream. Otherwise, you, you could find it very difficult the moment you face adversity because everyone will face adversity on that travel. And I think also you, when you purchase a dream, You, you don't have to be afraid to go away from your country. You have to travel a lot like you, you, you did in your career as a coach and as a player maybe. Uh, you went to England, you, you are here now in Belgium, in different cultures, you know. And I would like to know what was the, the most difficulties when you went to England or here in Belgium to adapt to these different cultural. I think, yeah, there is the area of your comfort zone when you grow. Everything is done for you. You got uh, people around you that they look after you. And then it comes to a moment that you will have to make a decision. Do I want to get out of that comfort zone or I want to carry on being safe? And the message for me is always um, I am where I am today in terms of being in Belgium because I'm a curious person. I always want to, when I get stimulated and excited by a challenge, I just, I just go for it. And I encourage anyone to get out of that comfort zone. It's not going to be easy, but I think it's so rewarding at the end of it of having to learn a new language, having to learn a new way of living different cultures. In life and in, in the world, there is no right or wrong in terms of how you live life. It's almost um, different ways and you need to choose it. And getting out of that comfort zone is the only way that you can see what you really like or what you don't. And I always uh, encourage young people to be curious in life. And I think football is a great uh, field to experiment diversity. And as a coach, specifically in Belgium, we have different players with different backgrounds from ethnic, religious backgrounds. And I, how do you manage this team? In like in Everton also, uh, you, 
you were the coach of, of Everton. How do you manage the team with all this diversity from uh, all over the world? Yeah, that, I think that uh, a dressing room in football is a really uh, clear reflection of society, of the modern society. There is a lot of diversity and you realize how powerful diversity is in a positive way when you have the common goal. And the way to manage people, any group of people, is to have that common goal. If you can find that reason why you are together, then diversity is very, very special. Because diversity means that everyone brings their own experience, their own culture to cope with difficult situations. Diversity when the things are going well, and if you want to go into football, when you win a game, diversity is never a problem. Diversity becomes a problem when you lose a game and there is adversity is because everyone reacts in a different way. Now, if you can use that reaction in one goal, which is win the next game or making history in a major tournament or whatever the aspect is, then is when diversity becomes fantastically powerful because it brings different solutions to the same problem. And if you haven't got a common goal, everyone will almost dismantle the group because that's how uh, you are as an individual. You have to survive and you need to use your experiences to cope with a difficult moment. And to answer your question, I always found, um, obviously in Belgium now, we know that we got this incredible opportunity of having different uh, strengths coming from different backgrounds. And that's the diversity that we have in the Premier League in the UK. I had to manage a team that it was 20 different nationalities. And I, I saw it. It was so apparent how uh, fortunate we were to have that diversity that other dressing rooms didn't have, that they only had the players locally, English players. And it's, it's easier to manage, is the truth, because obviously everyone thinks the same, everyone has the same background. But the challenge is that if you can get everyone together from different backgrounds and different diversity and different nationalities and different ways of thinking, you become a stronger group. And I think that's a beautiful mirror of what we get in society. If we can get all in the same uh, direction, it becomes a, a wonderful, rich society. And I think this uh, dynamic in the dressing room, it's very interesting to understand racism because you speak about uh, the, uh, to have a common goal. It's winning the next game, winning the titles and uh, winning, uh, winning things in football. And if you have a common goal in the football world to tackle racism, on uh, all supporters can say that no, we we are we don't want racism anymore, and we have a common goal. We can tackle uh, this uh, problem and uh, be more. Uh, I don't know how to say that, but be, be more uh, inclusive and understand other people. You know, so I think the, the dynamic in the dressing room with all these, these different cultures, it's also interesting to put that in the, the stadium to take out this problem in racism. Absolutely. I think, obviously, my own experience has always been, I've never had an issue of racism in my dressing room um, because I I always seen people that they respect each other. And we, we almost open up to everyone to be themselves. And there is a very clear line, what's uh, no tolerance for certain aspects. And that's very clear what's right and what's wrong. Racism is clearly that. And my experience has always been within the group um, of empowering each other, of helping each other, of discovering from each other, from learning from each other. I never had an issue. When I had an issue in the stadium, as you mentioned, in the crowd, it's been more lack of education. And I think I've been pleased now to see in the last few months, it's been a real clear message to educate people. Well, there are certain cultures that they think that that the, um, some comments, some chants uh, is a bit of uh, fun or a bit of banter. And that's where it needs to be a clear line. There's no tolerance. This is not a, a matter to, to, to joke about. This is a, a very serious a starting point where everyone needs to understand that we need to be inclusive. Life should be full of respect of each other, to care about each other. And then from here, you become very powerful. And I've seen really good reactions where people get educated in that manner because there are certain countries that I think they showed a bigger issue in the past than, than now we need to come very, very aware that this, uh, this is the moment to get rid of any single sign of, um, of no tolerance aspects. 
And I would like to know always, how do you react as a coach when you hear uh, racism things in uh, the stadium? Like you are the coach, you need to uh, make the tactics, be uh, uh, aware of what happened in the, of, uh, in the field. But when you hear the a racing thing in the stadium, how do you react as a man and emotionally? I've, I've never been in a, in a live game that that's happened. So uh, I can only tell you that sometimes I've been maybe distant seeing a player that is feeling really sad because of an issue of racism. And that's where it really hits that um, something is seriously wrong. And it's more about anything that it makes my players uh, sad is, is a serious, serious um, topic. And in, in, in this case, I think the institutions are taking uh, a big role on making sure that we all um, police that situation. It's not down to just the institutions, it's just everyone should make everyone aware that there are certain aspects that they shouldn't be in our lives. But in my experience, uh, I've never been in a situation where I had to, I, I've been involved in the middle of, of a game where it's been a racism act um, in that respect. I think also that the racism uh, problem is has to uh, take place in the highest level, like the FIFA, even UEFA, should make a thing to tackle this problem in the stadium, but also in the institution of the UEFA and the FIFA. And maybe that is the point where we can make a common goal, where all the football world and the football people, the people who like football, can come and say, OK, we are enough of this. So, uh, Absolutely. I think at a board, boardroom level in all the big institutions, needs to be uh, reflected a little bit what we have in the society and we need to have that diversity and we need to be uh, is, is that is a moment that we need to talk about these issues um, we've seen it in the last few months and in the middle of this uh, COVID-19 where the sport stopped and then it comes back and the message was very very clear that it, it is a moment that now we can't look away or is almost not wanting to tackle a, an issue Um, I just feel that now is the moment that everyone is conscious about it. The message needs to be very clear. We all here in the life, we all the same, and we need to just care for each other and live with respect. All the aspects that it could go against it should be no no tolerance, but it, it should be reflected from the boardroom level of all the big institutions would need to have that diversity. Otherwise, maybe there are issues that we leave as not a priority, clearly now is a priority to get this sorted before we can go into more uh, specific details of the football itself. This is a, an issue of society. You were speaking about uh, the COVID-19 and I was wondering, uh, as uh, the head coach of Belgium, like COVID-19 comes and football ends. Everything ends. How do you react? How, what do you think? What was your feeling out? Football is not that important in life or what did you Did you take time to think or take a break or go back to your family in Spain or I don't know? Yes, no, no. I think um, it, it has been a moment that all of a sudden you go and we all go 100 miles an hour with our daily worries and the daily work and the daily targets. And then you realize that life probably has got a, a, a more deeper um, function. Uh, and that's just caring about your people, your family, and understanding what's really important. And all these aspects that we haven't been able to do, like meeting the people that you want to meet, um, being able to see your mom and dad, uh, people that they are probably in that in that difficult age group, um, not being able to hook people. Uh, they, it makes you think. But that's where it brings a real individual responsibility. This is an, a common enemy. We have to be this enemy and we need to, at the end of it, we need to become better. This is a test that has been thrown into society and it would be a shame if we cannot get through it with a bit more conscious of how we live life and what it really matters at the end of it and become better uh, individually and as a, as a community. And uh, I think also that the family for the players are very important. To have a good player on the pitch, you have to to have a, a, a big uh, uh, family near to the to the player to have a good player and i think the for like a lukaku or the brain i know that the family for us for them is very important do do you uh, you uh, accept that when uh, they are here or in to be or 
in the center of a Belgium national team, family comes and uh, talks to uh, Lukaku or De Bruyne? Yes, um, I think what you're saying is totally right. There is never exist just a footballer on his own or an athlete. Uh, you got the human being around the footballer. The footballer only is a match day or when he's training. The most of the rest of the day is a human being that he needs to feel happy and needs to be satisfied and needs to feel that the, the family are, are enjoying life in order to be able to perform their job in the best possible way. It's exactly the same than any other person. And that's why we always consider very, very um, in detail, especially in big tournaments, that the human being can still be happy during a big tournament where you don't see the family as often. And in, in the World Cup uh, in Russia, we organized a few days that we had contact with the families that they could come in. We had barbecues and it's almost seeing, um, almost training the human being and, and make him feel that he can be satisfied. And then all of a sudden you can become a footballer. I don't think um, a period in the World Cup is almost 50 days. If you were going to be 50 days without seeing your family. This is, this is very dangerous. I don't think anyone could be a good footballer on the pitch if all of a sudden you have to stop seeing your family or do your normal things for 50 days. Like you said, that football is not only in the, on the pitch. It's all the things that, be, uh, that it, it, uh, it's near football, the family, the friends, how they see life, uh, the movement like uh, Black Lives Matter. We, see, uh, we saw that in June, a big movement in uh, the world, in the uh, America spe specifically, but uh, it's really uh, not only football when you, you talk about a player or a coach. And uh, over uh, Black Lives Matter, what was your re reaction when you heard about that? I think it's been a very strong message. Um, obviously, we were following very closely how our players were part of the movement. And I think it was a really strong um, way of starting the sport because at that moment, everything was stopped And when the competition came back, most of our players came back with that message at the beginning of the games. And I think it was a, a wonderful reaction. Everyone wanted to almost be part of it and understand what it meant. And I think that's what it needs to move on. You can't be left on that. I think now the movement needs to progress and it needs to uh, see real results on, on, on people's actions at every level. But I think the, the reaction was of uh, respect, of understanding, and everyone coming together for a, for a common fight, which I think it was very important to, to highlight. We were all fighting COVID-19 and the virus, but there are other issues in society that now is the time to show the same togetherness to fight those. And I think that's the reaction um, I got from uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and probably other specific In individual countries around Europe, they had different uh, movements that they've been very positive. It's also, I think, very important for Lukaku, we are known in Italy, the Black Lives Matter movement and all this movement uh, to be uh, respected on the pitch because uh, when he played in, it in Italy, when he, he go to uh, Cagliari, mm -hmm. most of the time the people uh, shout out racism things on him. I don't know if you call him after the, this event or... Uh, I think Romelu is a, is a fantastic ambassador for, for this issue. Um, he's very mature. He's been through many different cultures, different backgrounds in Europe, and he's played in different leagues. And I think he's someone that is, is, still, um, is still sad when something happens, but uh, I think he's very strong to be able to use that anger, if you want, to To, to almost resend a stronger message and it affects people. I get a lot of people um, that they, are, they need to be educated in that side. And I think Romelu has educated a lot of fans and a lot of people that they felt that that was maybe a bit of fun that it happens in sport. And this is a very thin line. There are many aspects that you can make fun on. But racism is an area that is, a, is, 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 is um, no tolerance in, in that respect. And, and that's where... Uh, the big institutions need to support. It needs to be consequences if people don't change that sort of behavior. But I think Romelu is always a very strong individual that he doesn't allow things to get uh, deeper because what, he does something about it. And it's almost that he gets stronger at the back of that. And I think it's a wonderful um, example for any other young person that he goes through 
a moment of racism or, or disrespect. That is the way you can't just come into a little bubble in yourself and allow it to affect you. You need to just fight back in a way that you will affect other people and you'll become empowered after that bad experience. I think you need to be strong on the pitch when you hear that, but you also need to be strong after, after the match to be more engaged and, and say that, no, it's not, uh, it's not possible to hear that again. So it's not only in the pitch, it's after also. Yes. And like you said for Romelu, it's very important for him to, uh, to go back and fight this. Yeah, and I think that's what I think we all learn about his way of 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 going through uh, these situations in terms of having a very good balance of being in control and being emotionally attached, but without um, getting away from sending a message back, but then not getting deeply affected that it could affect his his game or his profession of his personal life, because that's very strong around him but then what we need to do is the institutions need to support that action and needs to make people that they don't understand it accountable for it and it needs to be uh, almost uh, a way of, of affecting people back but Romelu has always been a, a real ambassador in this respect and I know for years to come he will always be an example in Belgium for, for all young people to be able to, to, to change the world in the way that we behave and to change the attitude of every individual. Don't allow anything to affect your inner self and keep it for yourself. And the institution uh, must support Romelu Lukaku on racism. But one problem, one of the biggest problems for me in football right now is homophobia also. Because lots of people want to st uh, go to stadium, look at football and like football, and maybe also player who like football. But in the stadium, you, you, sometimes you hear homophobia things. Mm -hmm. and. For, to me, it hurts, but uh, the institution don't say lots of uh, things about that. Yes, and I think that probably needs to be done a little bit, uh, as I said, including I think the board members, the, the technical committees of all the big institutions need to um, have members that they can bring a lot in this subject and do something about it. Because, um, as I say, when you look deep into what the teams and the, the, the national teams and the players and on the pitch, um, the behavior is, is, is very good. My experience has always been that that's never been an issue there. Of course, you will get maybe things that other uh, uh, colleagues could speak about. But I think the problem is more when the institution can do something about it to affect the global audience, which is society in general. And that's those are the aspects that we need to be open and honest and, and face it. Uh, this is an issue that we can't just swipe under the carpet. We need to make very, very clear that certain behavior in a football stadium is not acceptable and it should take consequences. It, it's, it's more on the men's football field because for the women's national team like that or uh, women's football in general, like uh, Rapinu, uh, who is a great player in the America, uh, homophobia is not a thing as big in the, in the men's football. Look, I think the challenge is more in the men's football than in the women's football. I, th I think when, when there is... Uh, uh, from my experience, I haven't seen you concentrating on what you have in, in, on the pitch and, and the dressing rooms. And that's, that's an area that I think has, been, has made a lot of progress in the last 10, 15 years. When I arrived from Spain in uh, 1995, I've seen a big difference in, in that respect. Now, the next step is, is, as you say, on the outside. I don't think it's such as, as uh, a specific women's football or men's football. I think there is individuals that they got wrong behavior and not, not just in sport, it's just in life. And that just, you can maybe see it through sport in these events. But I think it's more about making sure that there is a clear line of no tolerance of this behavior and spotting this behavior. It's very difficult to generalize where this happens. And I think institutionally is an easier way to, to clamp down to when that happens in a, in a major event. You saw a lot of difference from 1995 from now until now in football as a player, but as a coach also. Well, obviously, I was a player at that time. I started coaching in 2007. But I think what the big difference is that people uh, talk about it. And this is an issue that you have to speak about it. 
and you need to share experiences and and, and you need to almost educate people um, I'm coming from a country that um, it felt at times that it was just a bit of banter a bit of a joke in 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 that that way of going to the ground and and trying to put off the opposition players and that was okay and I think it's been a big difference people talking about it and the change of behavior in that respect. So I think that's been the biggest change from 95 until now, that people is is almost open. And when something is not done correctly, you can come out and speak about it and do something about it. It's a bit more, I think we are in that moment now that if that behavior still is there, it should be accountable for it. At the institution level too, the institutional level must support. Yes, and I think that's where having that diversity at board le- a boardroom level is necessary because it needs to reflect what we have in our society. And it's very difficult for people to discuss big issues and make decisions. The decision makers in technical committees, you need to have the issues that they reflect the society. And at, some, at times you're only focusing on, on the good running of the institution and you don't get the full x-ray of what's happening in society. And that's why the diversity at boardroom level will bring those issues. And I think then as institution, you can react towards it. And probably that would be the beneficial aspect of everyone that is involved in sport and therefore following sport, which is everyone, that you can get very strong messages. On the field, football is more diverse than in the institution level. Yes. Like you said, so it's a, a big problem because the... The institution level this doesn't reflect the football field. Yes, and I think that's why in and on in a pitch the society also. Yes, but on a pitch is 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 very dynamic. You always find solutions. Do you want to get the team better? You need to perform better. So it's a constant assessment. Um, then what you see on the pitch is what you see in society. You get a lot of uh, different uh, movement of players, and that comes with different backgrounds. A boardroom level, always the assessment comes maybe every every five years, every 10 years, every 15 years. And probably that's where it's harder to reflect a boardroom level what's the image of the society in the modern uh, in the modern life. And that's why we need to be conscious of that. And probably we need to open up and try to reflect a boardroom level what's the diversity in, in our society at this point. So maybe the institution should move as fast as football. Yes, I, that's sometimes is there are aspects that it's great to talk about it, and then it's the reality of it. I think there is a combination. Uh, I feel uh, in Belgium now there is in our federation, in the in the football federation, uh, our CEO Peter Bossart is making sure that we got uh, a clear aspect that we need to be dynamic at boardroom level and the technical committee, and it needs to reflect all work of lives in our society. And I think that's a way to do it. You need to have um, a, a driving force to try to uh, almost generate a new look in the boardroom level because otherwise it's very, very difficult to get what's happening on the beach represented at boardroom level. And I'm, I'm very proud to see the movements that we're doing in the Belgium FA. And maybe diversity is the best way to get a better team and a better society also at, uh, at the highest level because the the people from different culture have different views on things and can say ah in my country we do like that maybe it's better than yours so the diversity is uh, help us to get a better team of course i think is any if you go just for the simple aspect of making decisions you become uh, a better decision maker when you got wiser information and wider information and different ways of doing things and different practice and Um, when you got issues, if you got those different views of individuals that they had different experiences, they've got different culture, backgrounds, it becomes a lot easier to make decisions that are going to affect what you're going to propose. And that's exactly what we are, are trying to, to see, that the big organization in the world and sport probably is the best, the most powerful weapon to get strong messages and to get people together and almost stimulate people in their lives to be able to to learn how you how you fight through your life to achieve the things you want 
uh, I think it's important that we got people at the boardroom level, at decision-making level, that they represent all the walks of life and the modern society. I think it's important to represent all this diversity, but also to uh, have in this institution level uh, um, old f for football players, because they know football. Mm -hmm. They face racism, like Lukaku or Vincent Kompany, that are no coach of intellect. But I think it's very important to get this player at the highest level, but because they know what they are talking about. Absolutely, yes. And I think it's common sense, if you think about it. You just want people that they need to make decisions and they can change the sport and uh, send strong messages to the society. People that they've been right in the middle, that they know what the issues are and that they got that experience of having to, 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 to live life through a football pitch, for example. So clearly it sounds common sense to me. Then the other aspect is if it can, if, if, if it can be done quick enough, I'm sure it's going to be a process, but um, it sounds real common sense. And what are your views on the development of football in the futures? even in the pitch or uh, in the society issues? I think more and, uh, more and more football is becoming very conscious of the issues uh, outside the pitch. Um, the organizations that they are leading football now, they are good structured organizations that they are aware that they need to have diversity, that they need to Uh, think about bringing things back to grassroots football, to uh, to projects around the community. I've been uh, very satisfied so, with some of the projects that we've seen. You always want more. Do you, you want to grow that side? And I think that's that's a way that UEFA and FIFA are thinking. So I think the future will be uh, a responsible future. I think it will be institutions that they want to make the big difference. And then sport and football is always the most powerful weapon to, to stimulate people, to make you believe in dreams, to make you able to fight every day and get up when you face adversity. So I think that the future of, of football um, is, is, is very, um, very encouraging. And uh, make a common goal for all of the football world, even in the stadium, in the pitch and in the dressing room for all of us to go to a better future. Absolutely, yeah. And I think the, probably in the dressing room, I've seen those values for a long time now, educating people and driving people. I think it's more about a little bit what we, we were talking about, this, the, the people that they feel that they go to a stadium and their behavior is not important. I think that's, that's a, an aspect that needs to be probably a having a longer vision and a plan of action to try to affect that. And, If you do the, the, the right things in sport and football, you will, you will have a knock-on effect in society. And we've seen it. Uh, I've seen it in 2018 in Belgium, the World Cup, uh, football, through football, the whole nation of Belgium came together. And I think that's, that's a, a wonderful feeling and you share in those emotions and you can see that if we can do that in normal life, we'll become a better society. So I think the vehicle is very clear. But I, I do feel that the football more and more is driving into that direction to be a sustainable business in one side, the other one to be an inspirational path for millions of youngsters. And then another one is that uh, being able to give something back to the community, to educate back and, 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 and take issues uh, in a stronger manner, in a united uh, way. I think if uh, we organize World Cup every two months, the society will get better <laughs> because the society always comes together and uh, we can see uh, people of all ages from uh, different backgrounds, different religions comes together and just celebrate the victory of the Red Devil. So it's always amazing to see that in the streets in Belgium, like you said, two years ago, it was uh, amazing. So football bring, bring us together, but maybe it can separate us. Uh, also, when you face racism in stadium, of course, yeah, any bad experience is not gonna is not gonna bring people together. But I think that's 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 probably the issue that we're talking about. Is is uh, diversity has got this wonderful opportunity of bringing people together when they got the common goal and the common behavior. When you haven't got that common goal, everything is going to be very disruptive and it's going to have an uh, opposite effect. But the experience that I had in the last four years in Belgium. I've seen better practice than bad practice and we need to carry on to try to achieve that, that as institutions uh, we can do even more 
to to make sure that the future will will be a lot more of good practice rather than those bad signs that you could see. Thank you, Roberto. I think the interview comes to an end. Pleasure. So, uh, I would like to thank you for your time, for this discussion. It was very interesting to have you. We have come to the end of these RBFA Youth Talks. Together with our Youth Council, the RBFA tackles discrimination on and off the field. For more information, go to rbfa.be. Do you want to be informed about the next episode? Then subscribe to this podcast in your favorite podcast app. Thank you for listening and see you next time.